Hello everyone, this is Bob Browner with Community Coronavirus Update number 88. Today we'll talk about school spread, some common misconceptions, uh, the need for a plan A and a plan B next time, and, and one to comment on booster shots. So uh, the good news is, at least here in Lincoln Lancaster County, we seem to be maybe having some leveling off of our, of our uh, case rates, although we are having some testing problems and turnaround problems. So it could be that dip is that the, the, tests, the tests are being delayed again. Uh, but hopefully this is uh, seeing some effect of our masking ordinance put in place. Uh, so this was uh, last week. We did have a masking ordinance put in place in Lincoln, and also uh, Lincoln Public Schools did go through all K through 12 masks. So hopefully we're starting to see the effect of that. Uh, also, it looks like hospitalizations might be leveling out in Lincoln Lancaster County. Although you'll notice that uh, they break it down into both uh, Lincoln Lancaster County residents and all, and it's the local uh, numbers that are dropping, not the regional. So Lincoln serves people around Lincoln. So the number of people from outside of Lincoln is is not dropping. Actually, it's just the people in Lincoln. So maybe that's a differential uh, from our vaccination rates and our masking in Lincoln that's going to have some effect there. Um, the big worry for me partly is that, you know, we have a lot of schools across Nebraska not putting masks in place. And what happened in fl the south, uh, regions four and six, which is all of the southern United States, if you look at specifically there's, that their children, their hospitalization rates are two to three times higher they were, than they were at the worst of the surge back in December and January. And so will we see a lot of hot pediatric hospitalizations coming up? Uh, this is also a further delay. So uh, like, for example, the children get multi-inflammatory syndrome. Typically that is happening two to four weeks after their infection. So all the kids started coming back to school a week or two ago uh, without, without mass, but we're probably not going to see the spread that would result in the hospitalizations from f till about four to six weeks after school started. So uh, we just have to wait and see on this, but hopefully enough have uh, put masks in place. Uh, Lincoln Public Schools, like I said, did put masks in place K through 12 last week. Uh, more and more schools are doing that. Uh, uh, so a lot of the schools in Omaha, Lincoln, Grand Island, and I've heard uh, even uh, some other areas in Nebraska are putting masks back in place, thankfully. Um, one person, uh, you know, might point out, well, geez, there's a thousand kids in exclusion. That means they're quarantining. That sounds like a lot. Uh, however, it's less than what it was last week before we put our masks in place. Uh, and on percentage terms, Lincoln Public Schools is pretty big. That's 40,000 kids. Uh, so, so yes, 1,000 kids in exclusion is a lot who we wish were in class but aren't. But on percentage terms, it's still fairly low. Uh, one thing I'd point out in this is that, uh, the, is that the K through 5, which started with mass, none of those kids are vaccinated, where half these kids in Lincoln are vaccinated, yet there's uh, not a big difference in the positivity rate, which I would say this is the mass are, are helping about as much as, have, as vaccinations are helping. If we add them together, uh, then they're going to be very, very effective. Uh, UNL is also tracking positivity rates. If I remember correctly, last week uh, they, they did a big sample of everybody, but now they're mostly sampling the kids that are not vaccinated, and you are seeing a big jump in the positivity rates here. Um, so, but, but anyway, I think our masking is helping. We are getting fewer people uh, having to quarantine, and remember the kids who are vaccinated also don't have to quarantine as much, and so that's an added benefit of being vaccinated in a school environment is it makes the quarantine exclusion much simpler. Um, and this is, uh, you know, compared to last year in November, we had about a similar number of uh, positives and exclusions last year at this time for November, uh, which to me is actually a success because many people are worried that Delta is being a much more infectious virus. Do we probably, if anything, need to be doing more than we did last year, not less. Uh, ventilation is becoming a big deal. Uh, Dr. Kate and Jenalina, your local epidemiologist, put a nice uh, summary together a few days ago based on, on school spread with some really good visuals about uh, opening windows, for example, the difference between a window closed versus open and versus open with an air cleaner, uh, seeing the difference in concentration. Uh, the good news, at least in Lincoln Public Schools, we've redone all the ventilation systems. They're all modern up to code and do three fresh air changes an hour plus six air, air, uh, air exchanges uh, per room. <clears throat> so if added HEPA filters, we might be able to do even better, for example, and then there are different degrees of HEPA filters. So uh, I remember, again, it's combinations of vaccinations plus masks plus ventilation uh, that's going to make a big difference. Um, now, you as a parent, if you're worried about your kid in that environment, uh, I would encourage you to consider stepping up to a better mask. Uh, the masks on this side are, are effective, but they're not as effective as a better mask. And so you might be getting, a, you know, say 10, 20, 30 percent reduction here, maybe 50, 60, maybe 80, 95 percent reduction if just you individually are wearing the mask. But remember, it's by the collective wearing the mask, those are all additive. And that's why the full masking is much, so much more effective and why we're going back to that in schools. Um, also, uh, Caitlin generally did link to some other articles. There's this uh, uh, summary put together by Ava Enns, and I've got a link in the notes section uh, that kind of does a review on masks for children because they do make KN95s and KF94s specifically for children that are sized better for them. So if you are more worried, you may want to consider stepping up to a better mask for your child. 
Uh, and again, like I keep saying, there's there's layers and layers. We want as much vaccination as possible, as much much masking as possible, best vent, much better, better ventilation as possible. All those things added together will lower our rates and keep ourselves to having a much safer community. Um, and, and I think yeah, we need to start talking about should should teachers be required to, to be vaccinated? And I think yeah, we're already moving that way in healthcare, the military, many others. Uh, this is a very very well publicized case uh, that put out by the CDC of a teacher who who was not vaccinated, who took her mask off during story time, uh, infected the entire front row of the class, uh, most of the second row, but even people in the back row. So three to six feet is helpful, but it is not a magic barrier. Uh, and so an unvaccinated, uh, unmasked person can easily spread to an entire class. So half the kids got infected. There were others infected as well, in addition to these 12. Uh, and so this is the problem that happens when you have an unvaccinated person in a caring environment uh, and the damage that they can do. Uh, we're still working on, on uh, Nebraska data. It's not active. Uh, Ted Frazier, who I work with in my office, he's pretty confident on most some of these uh, counties that we can give you accurate data. So if you want to look at your own CDC thresholds, these are probably halfway solid, but the state just isn't sharing the rest of the information. We do have more visualizations on vaccination rates for specific age groups if you want to use some visualizations for Nebraska to kind of see how you're doing. Um, the next thing I want to talk about are some very common misperceptions that are kind of hampering our control of this. One is getting people to understand vaccine decisions are a risk versus another risk, not a risk versus no risk. Uh, there's something called the base rate fallacy I'll talk in a little bit. Uh, there are different degrees of sick, so people, it's, this isn't just a binary thing, I get an infection, I don't get an infection. And also it's becoming clear you're taking more than chin, one chance at dead because the, the people who got infected uh, six months ago are now getting infected again. We've got over 300 positives in Lincoln of people who were previously infected and thought probably thought they were immune. Um, so first, uh, this visual from the uh, British Medical Journal basically looking at some of the complications around clotting, for example, with uh, COVID versus the two of the vaccines that they're using in, in, in England. And what you'll see is that, yes, there's a little bit of risk for the vaccine itself, but the risk for COVID is much higher. So the, the, the uh, magenta, I guess that's the color, uh, the, clot, the risk for the actual getting coronavirus are much higher for almost every, for basically for every single thing. Uh, you'll see the same thing with myocarditis. Uh, for example, uh, there is a little higher risk of myocarditis in young men who are vaccinated with Pfizer. However, the risk of myocarditis from, from coronavirus itself is a 16-fold higher risk. And so people need to keep remembering that the COVID risk is much higher than the vaccine risk when there is a risk. Uh, overall, the vaccine risks are often very low in the range of on one, to, one in 100,000 to one in a million. So extremely low, but the risk for coronavirus are much higher. Um, you know, base rate fallacy. I keep getting these people emailing me stuff saying, what about this Israeli data? Look at all these vaccinated people that got sick. Uh, and they're kind of making what's sometimes referred to as a base rate fallacy argument. And then yes, the numbers might, absolute numbers may be higher, but you have to look at the rate, not just the absolute numbers. A uh, common uh, scenario used is, for example, I know it seems that lots of librarians are shy. That doesn't mean that all shy people are librarians. And so librarians are a very small group of the population where salespeople might be a much larger pop group of the population. So just so people who are shy may be more likely to be salespeople than librarians, actually, in absolute numbers, but not in percentage terms. And you need to look at both absolute numbers and percentages to really get a, a good handle on this. And it's a common mistake made uh, with people looking at data. So uh, another way to look at, although is also degrees of sick. Um, so for example, if you look at the age 85 plus in, in Brian's hospital that they released this visual yesterday, yes, five out of the four are, five are vaccinated versus four unvaccinated, but these are people very old, very sick, uh, have other underlying health conditions. But overall, you'll look that almost all the other age groups uh, are unvaccinated, and uh, this is a high percentage population. So over 90% of the people in Lincoln over 65 are vaccinated. But if you look at how sick people, the, all the ICU and ventilator patients are unvaccinated. So yes, there's a few vaccinated people landing in the hospital, but they're mostly older, sicker people to begin with, and they're not getting sick enough to be in the ICU or ventilator though. So a lot of our deaths are happening in that group. Um, so like I say, you know, we're, we're approaching over 90% in some of our populations, especially the 65 to 75 year old, uh, making some progress in the 12 to 15 year old. So, you know, this is one shot, two shots. So in a few more weeks, we'll be over 60% vaccinated 12 to 15, which is great to see, uh, but really would like that in the 70, 80% range. Uh, and another thing to keep pointing out that those people on ventilators, there actually are two people in their 20s today in Bryan Hospital. Uh, those are young people who didn't have to be there. A vaccine would have prevented almost all of those essentially. And most of them are, are people under 65 because that's the pool of people that are not vaccinated, at least to the age that people over 65 are. 
So the other thing, like I keep pointing out, the degrees of sick. Yes, there's some people who are lucky and get an asymptomatic infection, although their immunity may not last. There's another group that gets sort of a flu-like illness, but then people keep forgetting the 10 to 20 percent with long COVID, the 2 to 5 percent who will have post-hospital complications, heart attacks, strokes, permanent lung damage, and the half to 1 percent that are just dead. Um, and I keep getting that that quote, well, people say only 99 percent are going to make it, so only 1 percent die. Yeah, but you're taking that risk more than one time, which is the other thing. So the analogy I might use is if I gave you a free uh, airplane flight to Las Vegas and I said, you know, the only downside is if the plane's going to blow up one out of 100 times, would you get on that plane flight? And actually, it's not just the plane flight there, it's the plane flight back there. There's another one in 100 chance. Would you be taking the flight to Las Vegas and back? Probably not. Uh, and so don't take this chance. Just get the safe, effective vaccine. Uh, and like I say, the studies are out there. So for example, the people with asymptomatic infections in this study, 92% of them had no measurable immune response. And so the immunity, yes, there is some immunity, but not enough that's protective immunity. And there are people who are getting uh, infected and uh, dying with a second infection. And so most people are, uh, most of the studies I've seen shown that the, getting the coronavirus, the quote, the natural way is equivalent to one vaccine dose, but it's looking like if anything, we need three. So you might be able to count that prior infection as one of your vaccine doses, but you still need the other two. So, and the problem, of course, is there is also differing types of immunity. So just because you have a measurable antibody against the Wuhan strain doesn't mean it's going to work against the Delta strain or the strain after that. Uh, a really good article uh, from a few weeks ago that I thought was very fascinating. There's a science article talks about the evolution of the coronavirus over time. Initially, there was some hope that the, the evolution, that the, va the variants were all sort of moving in a similar direction such that there was going to be a limited escape from immunity, but it looks like they're not all uh, uh, evolving in, in the same direction. There are different directions, different infectiousness, uh, uh, with the Delta being the most infectious so far, but also some with uh, some uh, more ability to avoid uh, immunity. And so if, if you had both a more infectious and a, a strain, as well as a, a strain that was better at avoiding immunity put together, we could be looking, looking at another surge here. Uh, and so we have to keep in mind, I hope this is our last surge, but it might not be. We could be in uh, surge four of four, but we could also be in surge four of seven. And we need to have a plan for that. So what I would say next is we need a plan A and a plan B, because we didn't even really have a good plan A this time. Uh, we knew uh, what we need to get vaccinated. Uh, you know, yes, I'm happy to see this uh, brighter dot, which is Lancaster County, but this is nowhere near the vaccination rate needed. 62% of the entire population isn't good enough. Um, the R naught of, of the Delta virus is in the six to eight range. Uh, so to have herd immunity, you need 83 to 87% uh, immune. Uh, that would be that would require 100% effective vaccine, which we don't have. A 90% vaccine, effective vaccine, we'd have to vaccinate over 90% of the population if we wanted to rely on vaccines alone. So we're probably not going to be able to rely on just vaccines alone. And of course, our immunity, the effectiveness seems to be dropping a little bit, although a third day's dose could push us back up to here. But we're going to need high vaccination rates to, to, to rely on vaccination alone, which we're not there. Um, so the spread, we could have seen this, we saw it happening, we saw it happening in India, we saw it happen in UK, we could have prepared, but unfortunately we didn't. So here it is spreading in Nebraska, you know, getting squeezed uh, from infections coming this way and this way in both directions. Um, we are now at a point where we have over 9,000 people a week dying in the United States again. Uh, hopefully we don't hit this surge. Most people don't think we're going to hit that half a million dead range, maybe 100,000-ish uh, from this next surge, uh, but we're going to ex exceed even the Civil War fatalities. People were looking at, you know, trying to put coronavirus deaths in comparison with all of our wars. We're actually over civil war, and this next surge may be as bad as Vietnam or World War I just from this surge alone. So keep that in mind. So plan A metrics from backing off, people say, okay, when can I take my mask off? And I'd say, well, here's some uh, criteria I've been throwing around to some folks. We'll see what, if we ha give a clear message, hopefully, in the future on this. I'd say, number one, hospitals have a have, has to have capacity for sick people before we take our masks off because they need a break. Uh, and you don't want to exceed hospital capacity because then mortality goes up, not just for coronavirus, but for everything else. Well, we need to reduce community spread, I would say, by the low, moderate, by CDC criteria, which is what I've been using uh, 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 for the last uh, few episodes. Uh, you need sufficient vaccine rates in a building, likely 70 to 90 percent range. If you had some immunity from the last strain, you might be good at 70 percent uh, for a few months, but then as that bat immunity wanes, you're probably going to be needing to get into 90 percent eventually. Uh, we need differential masking, I think. I think if you're going to choose not to wear a vaccine, then you have to wear a mask, and I think we need a vaccine verification system in place, and we need adequate surveillance testing and to be proactive next time. Um, you know, this is where we were um, we we could should have known way back here that we needed to make a difference and we didn't. We let it go too far before we put our mask ordinance in place. Uh, people need to understand we are in a linear, not we're in an exponential problem, not a linear problem. If you wait to make your decision here, it's too late. You need to make your decision back there, uh, which is this article. 
if you want to read more about it, uh, basically talking about moderate, just moderate COVID restrictions can can work by themselves, but you have, but the timing is critical, and you have one week to make that decision, not a whole month uh, to drag your feet and hem and haw. Lastly, we'll just talk about booster shots. There still are no concrete recommendations for most of us yet, uh, although they should hopefully be coming out in a few weeks. Some people I know have already started. Uh, so, for example, uh, some doctors I know, they, they have excess vaccine. They'll just give themselves the shot rather than throw it away. Another person was in a high, I know a coworker was in a high V, and they just announced over the intercom they've got extra doses, so we got his third. Uh, but what about J&J? &J? And there's, there's just less data on that. And I think an honest question you certainly could ask is, what would you do? Uh, me, I think if I had J&J, &J, I'd probably go get the booster right now. Hopefully this is helpful. Again, a disclaimer, these are my opinions, not necessarily everybody I work for, uh, but uh, hopefully these are helpful to you in the old episodes or on healthylincoln.org, or you can just go to the YouTube channel.